OK, so sorry for that. There's always little issues in the beginning of the semester making sure that everything works. So today marks our official, official first real class day. Um, I don't like to count last class because we don't really do anything, and we just introduce ourselves and that sort of thing. Um, so I like to take a day that's not explicitly about the software that we primarily cover in this class. So it's not going to be about Photoshop, for example. We'll start Photoshop next week. But I, I like to take a little bit of time and talk about things related to a digital life, computers, file systems, organization, those kinds of things, because I think it's relevant that we talk about that in the very beginning. I used to save this for this lecture for toward the end, and I found that if I did it in the beginning, it might help you throughout the semester rather than giving it to you at the end. Um, so today's lecture is technology design and architecture and how they kind of come together. So we'll start with organizing your digital life. Um, keeping the chaos at bay, how do you deal with your files, your calendars, your emails, and that sort of thing. And I'll walk through some strategies that may help you. So there's two primary ways of organizing your files on a computer. And the first one is if you have a flat file system, which basically means you have a document folder and you throw everything under the sun into that document folder. Or maybe you have it slightly more specific and maybe you throw all of your Word files into a folder called Word or something like that. It's a very broad strategy for how you would organize your, your work. So there's your documents. In this case, in this example, I separated it out by program type. So all the Illustrator files might go together. The InDesign files might go together, et cetera. This can work because if you're, let's say, you're working on English papers, you know your English papers in the Word documents folder. Um, but it's not exactly the most organized system. And what can happen is you can end up with lots and lots and lots of files all in one folder. And you have to kind of search and browse through and see where all of the various pieces fit uh, or where I can find anything. So there is some logic to it, but it might not be the best organization strategy. It is, of course, easy to find files of a specific type. If you know you're looking for a Word file and all your Word files are in one folder, well, you can find it, certainly. It should be there. right? It's very difficult, however, to keep projects separate. It's difficult to keep, in your academic life, your classes separate. It's difficult to, uh, let's see, if you have your, you're working and you're at school at the same time, it's difficult to keep work and school separate. Everything gets commingled. And that can be problematic, right? It also means that your folders tend to get really large, hundreds and hundreds of documents, harder to find things, takes longer uh, to go through it. So how about a hierarchy instead? Uh, and this is the system that I would recommend um, as you start to organize your files. A lot of you probably do something in this strategy already. Um, but we'll go through it just in case. So generally speaking, whether you're in OS X, which is the Mac operating system, or if you're in Windows, or maybe you're in Linux, um, generally you have some kind of a folder that starts with documents. And that's generally where you put things. Some people like their desktop for some reason and throw everything on their desktop, but that can get a little chaotic. Um, so generally people are using their documents folder. Um, inside of that documents folder, maybe you're going to separate uh, with some subfolders like school, work, personal, maybe, right? So that that keeps some broad categories separated. If you had a school folder, maybe you separate by classes. So all your folders for one third, or all your all your work for 121, for example, would go into one folder. All your work for this class, 135, would go into one folder. Maybe inside of those folders, you'd separate it still into these are my exercises, these are my assignments. Right? So you can really start to dial this stuff in. And I can tell you from practice that it works very, very nicely when you have lots of projects going on at the same time. You know all your files for that project are in one folder. So it's project-based rather than file type-based. It's pretty easy to find your files as long as you know what project you're looking for. Right? If we're working on assignment one, if you go to the assignment one or excuse me, assignment 101 folder, it's going to have all your stuff in it for that. Right? Um, the nice thing is that if you really want both, you can get both using smart folders, which means show me everything that's a Word document. So you get that in addition to a nice uh, project-based organization. So if I were extrapolating this onto your flash drive, hopefully you all brought a flash drive or a hard drive today, because we will start using it today. You'll start saving things on your flash drive today. You would start with the root of your flash drive. Inside of that, um, we're going to have a folder called Dropbox, I hope. Uh, which will help you back up some of your most critical stuff. You might have another folder called resources for stuff that doesn't really need to be backed up, that can be replaced if it needs to be, but that you might like to have easily accessible. 
And then say inside your Dropbox folder, maybe you'd have a folder for this class, 135. Maybe you'd have a folder for one of your other classes, uh, whatever that might be. Inside of that, maybe you'd break it down into assignments, exercises, et cetera. So the other thing that's important is to think about how you name files. And all too often, we just name whatever comes out of our head at the time. You know, English paper one. Right? That might not be the most accurate way of describing your English paper. It would be nice if there was something a little bit better um, to identify what your projects are uh, and make sure that you know that all of these files go together. Right? So this was a strategy that I developed when I was in grad school to help keep my files organized while I was working on this. And that was to assign a prefix to any file related to a particular class. And I developed the prefix based on what the subject was, what the course number was, and who the instructor was. And it, in, this, in the DVC world, it kind of doesn't matter because the chances of you repeating a class aren't very high. Uh, but in grad school, when you're in the advanced studios, every class is 201. And so you take 201 three times. Uh, so you had to have a way of distinguishing what it was. So in this case, if you were taking 121 with Professor Abbott, uh, your prefix would be A121A. And that just goes in front of any file related to that class. And if you know that and you keep track of it, it makes it really easy to find any file related to that particular class. Um, is this required? No. It's just something that I'm trying to share with you as a way of helping keep your life a little bit more organized. right? The suffix goes at the end. And how many people number their files? Right? You're working on your AutoCAD file. You do one version, then you save it as version 2. And then you keep working, and then you save it as version 3. Anybody? Right. Shockingly few of you. right? <laughs> Well, a lot of times when you're working, you might want to take, you, you get to a point where you kind of like what you've done. You don't really want to undo what you've done, but you want to try something new. And so you get a point where you might fork, right? Which means you might go one way, you might go the other way. You save your file, and then you give it a new name. Well, the easiest way of doing that so they don't disrupt the, the file structure is to add something at the end, right? And the natural thing is to number them 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03. So I, I took it a step further. I do number to get a basic addition of my file, big steps change. But then I also put a version number after it, which is a letter. Um, and that is like a small, subtle change. I do a rendering in V-Ray. I get my first version out. It looks pretty good, but I want to tweak a material. Instead of overwriting the original file, I just add instead of A, it's B. Instead of B, it's C. So that I can have multiple versions of a file as I'm kind of tweaking the last little settings. So it gives a little bit finer control over how I'm numbering instead of just Con continuing to number. Again, completely optional, but something I want to throw out there as an idea for how you keep yourself organized. So combined, we have the prefix A121A. This has to do with Architecture 121 taught by Daniel Abbott. The stuff that goes in the middle, I could care less what it is. You can name it whatever you want. right? And then at the end, this is the addition and the version of this particular file. If you do something along these lines, it will help a lot in terms of your organization. So a couple notes about file names. On Windows and OS X, it's really not a big deal to have spaces in your file names. Um, the, the operating systems handle them nicely. The problem comes if you ever upload your work to a website. And you'll find this on, on this course website when you upload your work. When there's a space, the web address, you've ever, have you ever tried to put a space in a web address? Like, let's say you went to Digital Tools for Architects, and you put spaces in instead of saying digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. It will take you to a Google search page, because your browser doesn't like spaces. Okay? So the web address doesn't get to contain spaces. So if you upload a file, and you're browsing to that file, and it has spaces in it, there has to be some characters that represent a space. And so if you've ever been browsing, and you've seen a file that has a bunch of weird characters interspersed in the file, it's like percent, percent, slash, whatever. Um, if those end up in your file, it's taking the place of a space. So if you eliminate the spaces when you're doing your work, you don't have to worry about that. It doesn't really matter, but it's something to be aware of. You can use dashes or underscores, which are great. Um, you saw that in the example, I used an underscore um, as a way of kind of identifying or separating words. File names also should not contain characters like forward slashes, question marks, or periods. And the reason that we don't include those particular types of characters is they represent something to computers. Right? A period represents end of file name, start the extension that tells the computer what to open the file with. 
So say we were working in Photoshop, it would be a dot PSD file. So anything period PSD says computer, open this file in Photoshop. Anything dot INDD, open this file in InDesign. Okay? So if we have a period and then you write some more characters, the computer gets confused as to what program it's supposed to open a particular file in. Sometimes that can be an issue. Sometimes computers are smart enough to figure it out. Right? Question marks generally have to do with computer code. They generally signify something um, that follows is a, is a variable in, a, in an equation. Um, so it's just something nice to avoid. Okay? So let's talk about backing up your data. So we've talked about how do you name your data, how do you organize it. Let's talk about backing it up. How many people actively back up their, their data? One, two, three. Three of 30. So we're at four of 30. We're at somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 10% of you back up your data. Okay? That's kind of scary. right? What happens when something disastrous happens? Okay? Do you have a backup? So I'm going to talk about how I back up. Um, this is not unique to me. It's not my philosophy entirely. It is something that was adopted, uh, or that I adopted, from a group of multimedia artists called the Pixel Core, based in San Francisco. This is their strategy for how do you back up your work. The best way to back it up is to have three copies of your files. This is so that you never lose anything. Okay? So you have your one primary working copy, the one that you're actively working on, and you have two backup copies that exist somewhere. And we'll talk about where those two backup copies exist in a second. You want to have, so that's three, three copies of your files, two different mediums. So you want to have your files on two different types of devices, right? Could be a hard drive and a CD drive. It could be a hard drive and a flash drive. It could be a, uh, a hard drive and an external hard drive, right? So different media, okay? Best hard drive cloud, right? Well, we're getting to that. The point here is that any media can fail. You guys will experience this at some point in your careers, I hope. It is not this semester, but it could happen, where you lose your flash drive, or you have it go through the wash, or you run over it with your car, or whatever. Right? That will happen. It does happen. So you will lose. Medium fails. Okay? So in an ideal world, we have three copies of our files. We have two different mediums, and we have one that is not with us, okay? which means it's off-site somewhere. Okay? Off-site could mean when you're at school, it's at your house. Right? Off-site could mean. When you're at school, it's somewhere in the cloud. Right? The good news is this has become very, very easy because of a lot of cloud sharing applications, cloud storage. We can throw things up on the cloud. We get a different medium. We also get it off-site. Right? So this is the, my house burns down. Do I still have a copy of my file? Now, if your house was burning down, would your first worry be about your exercise for this class? Probably not. Okay? And I recognize that. However. It may be that there are files that are absolutely critical of importance that you don't want to lose. Right? And I'm not being presumptuous enough to think that it's my class files that you're worried about. Right? But there probably are things that, that would worry you. Okay? So I'm in the engineering technology lab. I'm right here in ET103. What do I do to adopt these 321 principles of backup? Okay? Well, you have one copy that's on your flash drive. That's your working copy. Everybody has that already. Okay? Ideally, we're going to throw one copy up into the cloud okay, via Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that. So there's, there's a backup. That solves the off-site part. It solves a different medium part. right? If you install then Google Drive or uh, Dropbox on your home computer, your laptop or whatever, that syncing service will copy the file back to your home computer. So you now have three copies of your files, right? two different mediums, and one is off-site. You've just solved the, the riddle. Okay, that's the idea. So we're going to spend a little bit of time during the exercise today making sure that you guys have a system like that that is set up so that you're actually ready to have your files backed up um, and can be protected in the event of catastrophic failure. Okay? So we also want to automate backups. If you have to manually back things up, you won't do it. All right? That's just the truth of it. You won't remember. You'll get busy. You'll be in the middle of the semester, and you'll be so sleep deprived and, and jacked up on coffee that it just won't, won't stick in your head that I need to back up. So it has to happen in the backup so that you don't think about it. Okay? What are your options? Okay? If you were talking about your home computer, 
Certainly, there are a bunch of built-in options. If you have a Mac, you have something called Time Machine built in that will deal with backing up your computer. If you have Windows, um, there's a Windows backup built in. There are, of course, aftermarket solutions as well that can work on your home computer. I use a program called Chronosync for my Mac. It's a little bit finer control over where certain files go. Um, and that way, I know I have backup protection. There are ways of cloning your entire drive where you just make a complete copy of your hard drive. And therefore, if your computer was to die, you could put the brand new hard drive in, and it would start as if nothing was wrong. right? Um, there are some a variety of other softwares that do essentially the same thing. There are also some online backup options that are out there that you can choose. And this is, again, for your home computer. Dropbox and Google Drive are both free. Um, Microsoft SkyDrive, or whatever they call it now, OneDrive, is also free. Uh, it's in the same kind of vein. You get a limited amount of space. In Dropbox, you start with 2 gigs, though if you refer friends and follow little Easter egg hunts online, you might be able to get up to 20 gigs uh, in your Dropbox account. So it takes time to, to get used to that or to build up to it. But at least you can start with 2 gigs for free. Um, Google Drives, you get, you get 15 gigs for free. Unfortunately, Google Drive doesn't have a mobile flash drive sync. Um, Dropbox has one. Um, so we're going to show you Dropbox today rather than Google Drive. Though some people have good luck with Google Drive, and the, the larger your files are, the more you might be moving in that direction. Um, when I say Google Drive, it could be the, the Microsoft uh, OneDrive. It's essentially the same product. Um, Carbonite is another example for your home computer. Um, it's an unlimited backup solution where it just backs up everything on your computer all the time. Um, but it costs money, and so it's not free. If you are running your own server, you can actually run your own cloud server that's a lot like Dropbox that does file syncing. It's called OwnCloud. But again, you're paying for a server that exists to be able to do that. So you want to make sure that you back up nightly. That means when you come home, there should be a backup happening. Um, ideally, that's going to happen via your Dropbox anyway. You want to have weekly backups. Right? You get where this is going. You want to have monthly backups. You just want to make sure you cover your bases. At the end of a semester is a really great time to take everything that you've done and burn it out to like a DVD or something and stick it in a folder somewhere. Right? Now, it used to be that you could fit everything that you did in a semester on a DVD. It's probably not so likely anymore. So you might have to just like store it on a flash drive somewhere. Um, but the reason that I bring this up as a semester is you will, as you go forward, have to make a portfolio. You're certainly going to make one in this class. But when you move on, let's say you're going to grad school and you want to make a portfolio for grad school, you want to be able to revisit all of your work. And there might be, there might, there might not be, but there might be a project that you did here at DVC that really is still relevant and you want to include in your graduate school portfolio. Well, if you don't have those files, if you don't have photos of that, that particular project, it's going to be really hard to recreate it and put it in your portfolio. If you, however, have a backup of what you did that semester, it's pretty easy to go back into your file, pick out that um, semester's worth of work, and go back and look at it. Okay? So it's just a nice way of kind of consolidating. I finished the semester. Here's all the work that I produced for that particular semester. Yearly is essentially the same thing. So offsite peace of mind is also a good thing. And we talk about Dropbox or whatever. But is there something that is so valuable to you that you would you know, die? if you didn't have any more. Okay? And you may or may not have this. I'm going to share an example in my life. I have photos from when my daughter was born. I have photos from when my son was born. If I were to suddenly have my computer crash and lose all of those photos permanently, I would be really distraught. Not a surprise. Okay? I guess it could be my wedding photos too, but I might be able to let those go. Right? <laughs> my kids are probably more important. Don't tell my wife, whatever you do. Okay? So those are of the utmost importance to me in terms of how do I save them and how do I protect them. So maybe I take this a little bit extreme. But what I do is I have a copy. And I only do this about once a year because it is manual. right? I go through, I collect all of my photos. I put them on a little hard drive. I used to put them on disk, but it ended up being like 50-something disks. So it wasn't worth it anymore. I put them on a little hard drive. And then I take it to my bank, and I open my safety deposit box, and I put my hard drive in my safety deposit box. It's a little ridiculous, but I know that those are safe. right? Now, the person that breaks, it, breaks into the bank to try to steal things and breaks into my safety deposit box is going to be sorely disappointed, because all there is is a hard drive. There's no gold bars or anything fun. right? <laughs> I wish, but no, unfortunately, it's only my photos. Okay? But the, the, the point here, and maybe that's an extreme example, is that I'm 
actively trying to protect those things that are most important. Right? The other way of looking at this, and I'll share a story from my wife's childhood. So she grew up in the Central Valley. And uh, when she was in high school, she was actually out of the country um, on a trip with her mom. And her stepdad called her and said, guess what? The levee's going to break. And our, either our house is going to flood or the other side of the levee in Marysville is going to flood. What do you want from your room? You have an hour. Think about that. Put yourself in that shoes. What in your life is that important? Right? I know if my house was going to flood or my house was going to burn down, I'd run to my external hard drive. I have a Drobo Bay of four hard drives, and I'd grab that. Because I can replace my computer. I can replace everything else. But that particular set of drives has everything that's important digitally for me. Right? So I'd be able to grab that. So you think about the same thing, both in a digital context and obviously in a physical context. You know, like uh, I want to save my yearbooks or whatever. My wife was in high school. The yearbooks were on the top of the list, right? But you have to think about what it is that you want. And so I'm not trying to scare you with a bunch of doom and gloom. I just want you to think about it, right? All too often in the course of a semester like this, somebody's computer dies or something fails. If you take to heart what I'm saying about backing up your files, you'll be just fine when it comes down to the end. Right? And I've had students come up to me at the end of the semester and say, thank you so much for giving me that lecture because I would have been screwed and I'm not anymore because I have my stuff. So back up your stuff. OK, so let's talk about calendars. This is another piece of the organizational puzzle. How many people actively keep a calendar? Wow. Wow. And you actually get your stuff turned in on time? Good for you. The what? Little notes. OK, that'll work. OK. Well, calendars may be relevant for you as you move forward in school. They might not. OK? But generally, it's nice if you have some kind of a calendar set up that you know what's going on in a particular class and when something is due. In an ideal world, a, a, let's, see, let's use a school example. An instructor like me would provide you with a calendar that's constantly updated so that it would just show up on your calendar on your phone. And you'd know, oh, guess what? Lecture is today, and this is what it's going to be about. Right? Or I have an assignment that's due in two days. Right? That would be automatically updated. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, in an ideal world, your calendar, whatever it is, would sync to all of your devices. It would be on your home computer. It would be on your phone. Um, it would be anywhere else that you might need it. So we've got a bunch of online options. We're going to explore the online options today. Um, I'm going to have you subscribe to a calendar today so that you get that experience. Um, we'll use Google Calendar, but if you have a Yahoo email account, you have a Yahoo Calendar. If you have an Outlook email account, you have an Outlook Calendar. All three are just fine. It's whatever you tend to use. If you have an email account that's not one of those three, chances are it probably has a calendar too, and we'll walk through it um, on a step-by-step -step basis. Sunrise Calendar is a, is a universal desktop calendar that you can choose to use. Um, it's, it has an iOS um, version of it. It's up to you. It's kind of nice because it sends you an a, um, email in the morning that says, these are the things that are happening today. It might be relevant. Uh, iCloud obviously has its own calendar as well, but that's kind of in the Mac ecosystem. So this is an example of um, Google Calendar. It looks essentially like this. Um, the nice thing, obviously, this is not this is not necessarily this year. It's, this is 2014. We're going back in time, um, but you can have a calendar where you can see what time is lecture, what the lecture is about, what time is the lab class, etc. If that populated with all of your classes, life would be great. You'd have your whole schedule mapped out uh, in a nice, easy way to see. Right? Same calendar in an Outlook format. It's essentially the same thing, uh, with your classes showing up. And the same thing in a Yahoo calendar. Right? So it's essentially the same product, just slight differences depending on which one you intend to use. So we're going to talk about how do you specifically subscribe to this course's calendar, uh, the hope being that there may be some other calendars um, that other teachers are doing as well, and you'll be able to scribe, subscribe to those. Maybe not. Okay. So a little bit about email. So the average person has three email accounts. How many people have at least three email accounts? Okay, so we, we fit the average. Okay, generally one's for friends and family. You give it to them. One's for work or school, right? Or one for work, one for school. You guys obviously all have a school email account that you probably never ever check, right? Uh, and generally you have some kind of like a spam trash account that you set up when you were 16 and then you never use it again. That kind of thing. Okay, 
The number of emails sent by humanity each day is approaching 200 billion. That's a lot of emails, right? The average person sends and receives 121 emails a day, okay? I probably get 500 or more emails a day, right? Unfortunately, the DVC faculty seem to think that reply all is a great idea. And so I probably get at least two or 300 from DVC alone. I don't understand why they think that's a good idea. But anyway, so maybe you're below that, maybe you're above that. It's a lot, a lot, a lot to go through. Okay, so how do we simplify and declutter email, right? If we strip the email inboxes down to a few accounts as possible, that can help, right? You can do this by forwarding an email account to another email account. So for example, I have my dvc.edu email account that you guys might send me an email to. That forwards into my Digital Tools for Architects account. I only have to check the Digital Tools for Architects account, right? So it, it consolidates, which can help. You want to decide which email addresses you really want to use and stick with them, right? Changing an email address can be really, really challenging over time, okay? So you probably all have your primary email address that's right now, okay? It may be fine. It may be not so professional, right? This is another example where, you know, sexyman123 at yahoo.com might not be the most professional email to have, right? That is not my email, so don't try to email me there. <laughs> so you may try to pick something that's related to your name or whatever. You want to think about an email that you're using long term needs to be professional enough so that you're willing at the age of 40 to give it out to people, right? You all in your 20s right now, maybe some of you are older than that, don't have to worry so much, but at some point you will. And changing your email address over time can be a little daunting, okay? So you stick with them. Certainly, enable spam filters. Try to get stuff filtered out if you can. The more you, you don't have to see, the better. And obviously, marketing people love to get a hold of your email address. And if you try to unsubscribe, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's always at least worth a try, okay? So this is an example of forwarding a Gmail. Um, if you go into your uh, settings, you can come up here to forwarding. You can check the box for forward a copy of my incoming mail, and you could type in whatever the email address. It's, it takes an extra step of verification to make sure you, in fact, own the email address that you're forwarding it to. Um, but that will allow you to take one account and forward it into another account. Right? It's also a good way of trying to switch an email account or get everybody who sends you emails to, to email from a particular account because then once it gets into that primary inbox, when you reply, it will have come from that primary inbox and people tend to switch and, and constantly reply to the same email. Outlook, essentially the same thing. right? has a different setting. Forward my email to a particular address. Okay. Um, you can also use an email client that helps you go through your email really quickly. Uh, I feel bad. I used to recommend something called Mailbox. It was a great application. I used it for about four years. Um, it got bought by Dropbox about three years ago. Oops, sorry, I'm jumping forward. It got bought by Dropbox, and Dropbox, as of last week or two weeks ago, said, nope, I don't want to do it anymore, and they killed the application. So I can't recommend that anymore. <laughs> Um, so a replacement might be Spark um, by a company called Readle. Um, it's a pretty good application. It's not available for the desktop, though. It's only for your phones. Um, but it helps with some basic swiping gestures, helps you get through your email a little bit faster. So if you're really struggling with huge quantities of emails per day, you might investigate something like this to help you get through it. Um, it's what I use now that I can't use my mailbox app. So another thing that, that may or may not be interesting to you um, is, a, is a product called Google Voice. It's basically it's a phone number that's independent of a phone um, given to you by Google, lets you send and receive text messages, lets you forward that particular phone number to a cell phone. So for example, I gave you all my phone number. Well, guess what? It wasn't my real cell phone number. It was my Google Voice number. So I can control whether it goes to voicemail. I can control what phone number it forwards to. Um, it can be a very easy way of throwing out a phone number without actually having to give out your phone number. Right? It's free. Um, if you leave me a voicemail, it will transcribe the voicemail and send it to me as a text so that I don't actually have to listen to your voicemail, which can be useful. Right? It's not perfect, but it's not a bad thing. Um, it also lets you customize greetings. So I could, like if I was leaving, a, if my wife called and I didn't answer, it could say something to her. If someone, one of you called, it might say something different. Right? So you can kind of customize it a little bit more. OK, so let's shift gears slightly and talk about the web and developing an online presence. 
right? And, and how we kind of have to start with the basics here about how the internet works. Um, the internet works essentially using something called the DNS system, which translates, it's kind of like a phone book. It translates a particular web address into a string of numbers. So let's say we were looking for wikipedia.org or something like that, or digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. That phone book, the DNS system, will translate the text version, digitaltoolsforarchitects.com, into the string of numbers that represents the address of the computer that serves up the content. So for digital tools, uh, the, the server is 162.220.8.188. Right? Now it would be really hard for all of you guys to remember 162.220.8.188. Correct? It's a lot easier to remember digital tools for architects.com, enter. Okay? So this is really, really useful to translate from numbers. So we access this information using a browser. Um, we're all familiar with Internet Explorer because it's what's built in um, on the PCs. I don't recommend it if you can get away with it. Uh, and I'll be really honest, I don't like it. Um, so I will try to prod you guys away from using it. Um, Safari is on the Mac, it's fine. Firefox is for everybody, and that's fine as well. Google Chrome is built on the same thing that Safari is built on. It's something called WebKit. It's considered to be the fastest browser uh, that's out there. Um, so I tend to recommend that. And there is a browser called Opera, or there was, and nobody ever uses it. <laughs> so you want to think a little bit with, with browsers about security. Um, in the old days, Internet Explorer was notoriously horrible um, because you would browse to a site and it would let the site install a bunch of software on your computer. Uh, now there's all kinds of blocks and pop-ups that say, are you sure you want to do this? Right? You're going to install something on your computer, type in your password, that kind of stuff. But you have to be a little bit aware. You used to get pop-ups all the time as ads. It basically blocks them now. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can choose whether or not to install Flash. We're moving to HTML5, which doesn't take Flash anymore. So there's, there's, there's issues related to it. The truth is most modern browsers are fairly secure now. So you don't really have to worry about it. Uh, and how fast the browser in, again, helps a little bit. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about Wi-Fi. You guys are all aware that there is Wi-Fi here on campus that you can log into. Okay. The scary thing about it is it is not a secure Wi-Fi system. Okay. Theoretically, when you're at home, if you have your router and you've changed the password on it, so it's not the basic default, whatever came with it, right? it's a fairly secure network. Your computer is unlikely to get hacked on that network. Um, you, can, you can safely share files with other computers or your roommates or whatever. Okay? If you're here at DVC and you log into the public Wi-Fi that's here at DVC and you have file sharing wide open on your computer, for example, Right? Somebody else on the network could start putting files on your computer, could install things on your computer. That's bad news. Right? So when you're on a public network, like the DVC campus or Starbucks or Pete's or whatever, you want to be very careful about what you're doing. Furthermore, any of your web traffic, right? if you go to digitaltoolsforarchitects.com and you type your post for exercise 102, right? theoretically somebody could be packet sniffing what you're doing and know what you're doing. Now, if you're, say, going to your bank, right? you log into Bank of America or Citibank or whatever, you see that little green bar that shows up or the little lock icon. Okay? That's a type of encryption that's completely secure. You don't have to worry whether you're on you know, the DVC campus email or the campus Wi-Fi or you're on Starbucks. It doesn't make any difference. Once you have that little lock, you're fine. Okay? That's called an SSL connection. So if you're at home, change your network so that it's not Netgear or Linksys with the default passwords, right? Yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is one of those things that always happens, right? You get your router from Comcast and it comes with whatever the defaults are, right? Somebody knows what those defaults are, right? Which I guess is convenient if you call them up and say, I don't remember what the password is, but theoretically somebody could get access to that information and could get into your network and could theoretically infect your computers, okay? The other thing is depending on what level of encryption is on that router, some people can get in, some people can't, they know how to to, to hack into a particular system. The older style of encryption called WEP is very hackable, crackable. Um, so it's, it's something to be aware of as you go forward. Okay? So if you want a little bit more security or privacy, you might consider something called a virtual private network or VPN, uh, which can allow you to tunnel through somebody else's network to a secure place where you can access. Um, so in this particular example, 
Uh, it's an encrypted connection to a company that you pay for that lets you have access securely out through their uh, servers. Um, so the, the example company that I'll use in this is a company called Private Internet Access. It's about 40 bucks a year or six bucks a month. Um, and it will, one, anonymize your browsing so that nobody knows what you're looking at, which may or may not be relevant to you depending on what you browse for. <laughs> Um, it also allows you to switch your outgoing location. And so the best example of something like this is, uh, let's say that I wanted to watch the Warriors. I wanted to log in and watch the Warriors using one of the NBA League Pass or whatever. If I wanted to do that and I was in my home geographic area, they'd block it and they'd make me watch other stuff. But if I want instead to shift my location to somewhere else so that I can watch the Warriors, right? I could use a system like this Right, to say, instead of being coming out in California, I'm coming out in New York. And now that I'm coming out of my encrypted connection in New York, let me watch what I want to watch. So, right, so it's a way of geographically shifting yourself. Uh, and I can show you guys an example of this um, using a virtual private network so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay? So it's something that might be beneficial to you. It might not. Um, but it is something that's out there. So here's the example. Right, you have your computer, you're going out to the internet, it's unencrypted, somebody theoretically can see what's going on. You add in an anonymizer or a VPN, and it encrypts the data from you to them before it goes out to the web. So it's an extra little step in the chain. So let's talk about passwords. As we continue in this doom and gloom security talk, it's necessary to talk about passwords. So um, in the last couple years, Russian hackers now have 1.2 billion passwords. Okay. I wonder if one of your passwords is one of those 1.2 billion. Probably a good chance at that. The average internet user has 27 accounts needing a password, and they only use six and a half passwords to do it. Okay. We, get, we tend to default into our basic passwords, and we use them over and over and over again. Okay. Most normal passwords, right? name plus year, dog name plus year, right? those kinds of things, can be cracked in about 90 seconds. Doesn't take very long. Okay? So one in, test, one in 10 passwords, and just think in the back of your mind, do your passwords fall under these categories? One in 10 passwords is a name plus a year. Okay? Two in 1,000 passwords was the word password. Okay? Love is the most common verb in a password, 12 times more common than hate. <laughs> and the most popular adjectives were sexy, hot, and pink. Okay, so we're learning a lot about the culture of internet passwords here. Okay, so faster the faster the computers are, the easier it is to crack a password. Okay, so a PC running a single um, graphics card. We, we're using graphics cards to we. I don't do hacking, but uh, hackers out there are using graphics cards because they're faster than CPUs to do this cracking. But running a single AMD Radon chip can try on average about 8.2 billion password combinations per second as it's trying to cut. This is a brute force attack. This is just going after letter after letter after letter. Okay? But the more passwords that are leaked, you guys have heard of things like, oh no, LinkedIn got hacked, right? Target.com got hacked, right? You, you hear this stuff on the news, right? And all of us are like, ah, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? I don't care, okay? The problem is that the more of these companies that get hacked, and they let the, the, the passwords out, right? Maybe they don't actually get into individual accounts and you know, work with your data, right? But all of those passwords that get leaked or get out in clear text are now known passwords. So if your password is one of the known passwords and somebody was trying to hack into your account, would they go through randomly A, 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 B? No, they'd try all of those known passwords first to see if it was one of those, and then they'd start randomly going after the A A A A A B A A A A A C passwords. Does that make sense? All right. So they're going to use anything that's known. So the more passwords that are leaked, the less secure any individual password is becomes. Okay. So this is a twelve thousand dollar computer that was um, put into uh, service for a particular uh, contest for cracking passwords, and so in this in this context. It um, took 12 hours to brute force an eight character password. So eight completely random characters put together, right? This computer took 12 hours to break those eight password, the, those eight characters in terms of trying it. 
So the point being, that's a completely random password, and it still only took 12 hours. Okay, kind of scary. Okay, so the tricks that you used to use to make your passwords more secure don't really work, right? So if you use mustache and then spelled it backwards as your password, right? Mustache forward then backwards. That's a known trick. So they'll try a password forwards and a password backwards as they're trying to crack an account. Okay, number substitutions, right? E's become threes, that sort of thing. Again, pretty obvious. They'll try with those kinds of um, changes. Also, capital letters, right? First letter of a word capitalized. It's a kind of a known obvious thing. Adding a few exclamation points afterward, right? Also a known sort of thing to do. Okay, so OMG, I'm in trouble. What do you do? Okay, so in an ideal world, you don't use the same password twice. Okay, you're going, wait a minute, I have 27 accounts, that's 27 passwords, that's a lot of passwords to keep in my head. You're right, you can't remember them, it's not possible. Okay, in an ideal sense, you want to use a password that contains numbers, letters, capital letters, spaces, and strange, weird characters that you can barely find on a keyboard. Okay, that's a great password. Okay, you want to make it completely random, the more random it is, the easier it is, uh, or the less easy it is for somebody to crack it. Okay? So you say, wait a minute, I have so many passwords, how do I keep track of them? The truth is that you need a password manager. You really, really do. Um, and you can choose not to do it right now, but at some point in your life, you're going to want to do this. Um, a password manager, there's a bunch of examples up here. One password is the one that I use, um, but LastPass and KeePass and Dashlane all do the same thing. They will, one, generate a password, it looks something like this. <coughs> Excuse me. It will encrypt all of your passwords and store all of your passwords together under one master password. Okay, so of course you have to memorize one random string of numbers permanently. Uh, once you have that random string of numbers memorized, that's your master password. You can always get in and see all the rest of your passwords. Okay, it should integrate with your browser, it should integrate with your phone, it should sync across your phone, your computer, your iPad because if it's not in a place, it's really, really annoying. Okay? So for example, I use 1Password. I have it on my laptop. I have it on my phone. I have it on my iPad. I don't have it on a school computer. So if I want to log into my Gmail account using a 16 to 18 character random number, letter, symbol, combination password, it's really annoying. And I'll admit to that being really annoying. But for the security, I'm willing to deal with it. The occasional time that I have to log in, um, on, say, Gmail on one of the school computers instead of my laptop. The other thing that happens is um, when you have a phone that has a thumbprint on it, right, so the Touch ID or whatever, you can queue the passwords to your Touch ID so you don't actually have to type in any passwords anymore. It recognizes your thumbprint and automatically will fill in uh, this random character password, uh, which is the ideal world. Okay? So in my life, I think I have like 300 online accounts. Uh, I know this because it keeps track of how many I have. Um, half the accounts I don't even remember that I've ever opened, but when I go to the website, it says, hey, would you like to log in? Here's all the information. So it works out pretty well, okay? But every one of those 300 plus accounts has an entirely different password that's randomly generated, that's at least 14 characters. Uh, if I was going to my bank accounts, they'd have 24 plus characters that are completely random. So it'd be really hard for somebody to get into one of my accounts, right? But I can only do this because of this kind of, um, of a piece of software. Right? So it's a little bit extra. The other thing you can do is use two-factor authentication. Your banks a lot of times will do this. You try to log into Chase and it says, I don't recognize your computer. I'm going to text you some, a number and you have to put that in. Right? So not only do you have to have your password, but you have to have your phone so that it can send you the code so that you can then put it in. Right? So it's a way of verifying who you are. Obviously, this is even more secure because you need to have that piece of the puzzle as well. So there's some articles um, that have been written about this. If you Google uh, passwords, it's a good place to, uh, to go. So let's move forward into branding yourself a little bit. I know I'm going to run a little bit long, probably 10 minutes longer than usual today, but we've got a lot of information to cover. Um, and this is something that's, that's really important, that's undervalued um, in our world, but I think is actually very, very relevant. And I think giving it to you early and having you think about this early is good in your architecture career. So if you... Um, if you don't actively manage who you are online, it will be managed for you by a company like Google. Okay? 
So in the old days, this is actually a little old because the dating guru apparently doesn't exist anymore. But if you Googled Grant Adams, the first top result would be Grant Adams dating guru. And that is not me. Okay? But it comes up as my name. So what I'm going to have you all do right now, because you all have your computers, is Google yourself. How many people have done this recently? A few of you. All right, good for you. So Google yourself. So it looks like I died after a freak sunbed accident. That's my, that's my top result Okay, when you search for my name. So the point is that Google's determining information about me. And by asking you to do this, I'm having you think about what is Google determining about you. Okay? So how can we change that into something that's productive? How do we establish our online di identity? Okay. We could buy our own domain name, grantadams.net, and brand ourselves that way. Right? We can decide on a uniform username or handle, so to speak, and brand ourselves that way. Right? Maybe it's Grant Adams or something, and that then is used on a variety of sites. Okay? If you buy a domain name, obviously you control it, and you control what's on it, right? and it costs about 12 bucks a year, and you're not subject to sites going out of business. Okay? If you were going to choose a domain name, you'd like it to reflect your name somehow, grantadams.net, something like that. Uh, your domain name can be up to 67 characters in length, though in reality, it's too long to type, and you'll probably drive yourself nuts. Okay? Digital tools for architects is too long, but dtfa.com wasn't available when I bought it. Okay? So you have to kind of work your way around it. Okay? You have the, the domain extensions, .com, .biz, whatever. You have to decide what's the right one for you. Right? And if you're looking into buying a domain name, you would obviously type it in and see if it exists. Right? You would do this by going to a domain name registrar. Namecheap is a good example. It's kind of the least expensive of the bunch. And when you, um, when you put that in, you can search in a field, and it'll tell you this is available, and I can buy it. It's about 10 bucks, 11 bucks, something like that. Right? You can also select hosting, or you can select a server, and then host a whole website. This is probably too much for you to do right now. So what can we do instead of that that doesn't involve quite such a large step? We can create something called a personal landing page. And a personal landing page is something that's out there that you control that brands you as you. Okay? And it's something that lets you collect the various things that you do online and put them in one place. It's something that you could give to a potential employer and say, here's all the stuff about me. Right? And you can look it all up there. Right? It lets you claim the projects and sites that belong to you, the things that you do online. And it also helps you control how the internet, or Google, right? because Google is the internet now, right? sees you. And that's certainly something to think about. I mean, it's not Bing that controls the internet. It's got to be somebody. <laughs> anyway, so um, easy landing pages. The one that we're going to use today in class is something called flavors.me. It's a great site, great for graphic people, um, because it will allow you to very easily create a website that's kind of customized to you. Um, Google Plus or Facebook allow you to do something similar to this. Um, somehow. Especially with Facebook, Google Plus, like I think, is a flop. But whatever, um, Facebook, it's it's always somehow tied to like your weird aunt from the East Coast, like comments on all your stuff or something. And it's I don't know. There's just something weird about it. The way that the circles work. This is something that ends up being a little bit more professional, a little bit more graphic. So that's what we're gonna uh, push for in today's lecture. So here's some examples of personal landing pages that people have done. Very simple, very clean. This is who I am. This is the stuff that I do. Um, and you can see that this is all using the flavors.me website. Um, there's a bunch of options that are available that really change how you see yourself and, and how you're branding yourself. So 
You want to also, after you create your personal landing page, get your name out there somehow, which basically means how do you associate your name and your work with all of your work, right? How do you make Google see that connection, right? And so you want to obviously create the personal landing page, but then you link that personal landing page to the other sites that you actively post content on. So for example, today, you're going to link your flavor site to your digital tool site and vice versa so that Google starts to see that association and see that link. Right? That's how your page rank gets higher. Okay? So we're going to um, update your specific profiles to your personal landing page, which we'll do on, online and I'll show you how to do. And then you're going to continue to just post on the digital tool site. And the more that you post, the more your link to your personal landing page is going to associate with who you actually are. Okay. So you also, and I, I like to throw this out there um, just because I think sometimes people when they're young um, make mistakes that they would like to retract. Uh, you, especially on Facebook, um, the number one thing that employers do when they go to hire you is they look you up on Facebook. Okay, It's really, really easy to do. And they'll look you up. And the hope is that they don't see the drunk photos of you last weekend you know, passed out on the floor covered in boxes. right? The good news for me is I was in college when none of this existed, so I'm exempt. Okay, Some of you are in college right now. Actually, all of you are. And so these things might happen to you. I hope they don't, but they might. And so you want to think about who you're friends with or who you let be your friends on Facebook and that sort of thing, because it will potentially hurt your image long term. And so just be aware that once something is posted on a site like Facebook, Facebook actually tends to own the rights to the picture. And at that point, you don't have control over it anymore. Okay, So it exists. So if it's not posted to begin with, you don't have to worry about it. So just be cautious about it. Yeah. What if your, um, your friends tagged you in a picture? You're more inactive on Facebook. Because I'm like trying or trying to be on Facebook, but the thing is, I end up not logging in. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's similar for me. Um, you know, I post to Facebook. By the way, as a policy, I won't become anybody's friends until you graduate. So that's just the way life works for me. Um, it's a way of separating you as students. But afterwards, you can be friends with me. That's fine. Um, no, the truth is, I don't. I don't post anything personal on Facebook at all. Um, I post my lectures, and that's about it. Um, I used to. If you if you dig back into my Facebook account once you're friends with me, you can see some old pictures and whatever from from a long time ago. But yeah, but at that point, I, I just don't really care about them. But I'm choosing not to use it as that venue. Um, if I want to share something with my friends, I'm going to share it with them privately uh, in a different manner. And I just I throw this out there because I want you to be aware that you can't get stuff back once it gets out there. Okay. So the other thing is, if you own an email or if you own your own domain name, you can obviously set up your own email, which is a really professional way of doing it, which can be nice. Um, Google will let you do this. Um, a, company for free called Zoho will let you do it, uh, which is always nice. Um, you can get Google Apps as well, branded under. So the key is separating yourself from having to design sites or do anything to just posting. And if you post a lot, you'll get associated with your content. Okay. Um, the other thing that we're going to do today briefly is we're going to establish a LinkedIn profile. So you guys all know that I'm not a huge fan of Facebook. I am instead kind of a fan of LinkedIn. And I think in the professional world, uh, it's worth having a LinkedIn page. It's kind of a, uh, a standard benchmark for people that are applying for jobs these days. It is essentially an online resume company. Um, and I'm going to encourage each and every one of you to do this as well as a way of professionally branding yourself. So you'll take about 30 minutes during your, um, your work today to establish a LinkedIn profile. This is my LinkedIn profile. Unlike Facebook, where I won't be your friends, I would love to be uh, an associate of yours on LinkedIn. Uh, furthermore, I think it's great because long term, I can recommend you for your abilities in certain software packages. And I think coming from somebody who's the instructor recommending you for your abilities in Photoshop or something like that, it's not a bad strategy. Um, so anyway, this is information about yourself um, and what your jobs are and that sort of thing. Yeah. How secure is your community? Secure from what sense? Well, that's always an interesting, it's always an interesting dilemma. Because the securest thing would be not to post anything. And if, if in this context you don't want to because you feel uncomfortable, I completely respect that and I won't make you do it. 
The other hand, um, there are potential benefits when you're applying for a job to be able to have something like this and to be able to give some of your information out. Um, this information is pr predominantly your work history and your jobs and that sort of thing. Um, if somebody really wanted to be an identity thief and steal you, I think they, they may look at LinkedIn and they may get some information. Would they get all of your information? No. Um, but you'd have to couple that with a bunch of other information. Um, and so this is, this is an example um, of, of somebody who could do social engineering on you, where um, I don't know if you guys read an article that came out, uh, I think, a week ago that said if you have an Amazon Prime account um, with some creative uh, customer service uh, shenanigans, so to speak, um, somebody can basically hack into your entire identity because they can get information via Amazon. And once they get that, they can snowball it. So with any of these online sites, Technically, I guess it's, 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 it's something that you run a little bit of a risk. I think LinkedIn is a much lower risk than a lot of sites that contain financial information. I don't think somebody would target LinkedIn. But it's certainly something to be aware of. OK? All right, so we're going to move. Actually, we'll take a break. Uh, we'll take a break for about 10 minutes. We'll come back at 9.20. And then I'll walk you through what we're doing as part of the exercise today. OK, so we're going to get going again. Um, I recognize that for exercise 102 that you have, there's a fair number of parts, um, though any one of the particular parts is not that involved, which is why there's lots of them. But there's lots of different things that we're going to try to cover. Um, as my lecture covered a broad range of things today, not as specific as it will be going forward, um, so is the exercise in terms of broad range of things that we're covering. Um, so we're going to start kind of in the same order that we went through in the lecture, we're going to start with running Dropbox off of our flash drives. And so the hope is that you have your flash drive today. Um, you may or may not have it, in which case you can always follow this a little bit later on, depending on what, um, you know, what works. I have a hard drive, not a flash drive. And I'm going to do the installation on a hard drive, so it will work just the same. Um, the step-by-step -step instructions are written out here um, in the Digital Life 0.3 Dropbox tutorial. Um, under Tutorials, Digital Life 0.3 Dropbox Portable. There is a Digital Life 0.2. This is for an old, antiquated flash drive. Um, most of you will, will just do the normal Dropbox Portable. Uh, and so I have the step-by-step -step instructions uh, with images that will walk you through how we're doing it. I will go ahead and, and do it live so that you guys can see me do it. Um, this is the kind of thing where it may take a while for certain pieces to, to happen, so I may jump around a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I've, I'm starting with step two here, and I'm going to go to this site. Um, I should have opened it in a new tab, uh, which is somebody. So Dropbox itself, the company, does not support a flash drive version of their syncing application, um, but it's in enough demand such that people will actually work on and actively support a mobile version um, that will sync a flash drive. And so this Dropbox Portable AHK uh, is not actually written by Dropbox. It's a special little plugin that's written by somebody else that will allow Dropbox to run off your flash drive. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the download link. And when I click on the download link, of course, the internet always runs slowly. Um, it will take me um, to a page where I can click on something called beta v 1.6.8.9, which is the current version. Uh, if I click on that link, it will take me to a Google group page right here, where I can click on the download of this Dropbox Portable AHK beta, which will then download into my browser. Of course, it's right behind my head down here. This file that we're downloading is a zip package, which means it's compressed. And I have to extract it then and put it on my flash drive. So once it's here, I'm going to go ahead and show in folder so that I can see it. This is in my downloads folder. We can see by the icon that is that zipped file. It has the little zipper on it. So I'm going to right click on it and say extract all. And I'm going to then browse for my flash drive, which would be under computer. Uh, mine happens to be called Bluestone. It doesn't make any difference what yours is called. Uh, and I have a folder called Portable Applications that I'm going to put this in. 
you can put it just in your flash drive. It's to, to me, having it inside of a portable applications folder is a little bit more organized, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I'll say OK. And then I'll click on the Extract button, and it'll go through the extracted process. Once that's done, I'll have a Dropbox Portable AHK folder on my flash drive, so I can see Computer, Bluestone, Portable Applications, Dropbox Portable. There's a .exe application inside of that folder called Dropbox Portable AHK. I'm going to go ahead and double click on that, and it's going to start the installation. Okay? So just like, let me back up here a second, just like here, we're now looking right here and following these guys along with the steps. There's really only a couple important steps as we go through this. Um, so we'll click Next, we'll click Next. We get to Dropbox folder location. I'm actually going to delete this little period so that I have my drive, which is E drive, followed by a folder called Dropbox. Right, that's the way I want it. I don't want my whole flash drive. I just want a folder called Dropbox to be backed up. I used to have people back up the whole flash drive. The problem is most people's Dropbox accounts are only 2 gigs. Your flash drive is 32 gigs or more. So it doesn't make sense to back up the whole drive because it won't fit in Dropbox. So instead, I'm just going to do a uh, backward slash Dropbox. That's going to be the folder. Go ahead and click Next. Click Next. We can click on Update Automatically. Doesn't matter. Next. Next. Okay. We get to this stage. It's going to ask us to download the Dropbox files. This is actually the, the real Dropbox files from Dropbox. Right? So it's downloading the current version of those files. And then I also like to change the icon color of my portable version to be, I pick red, you could pick any color you want. The, the reason that I pick a different color is because Dropbox is supposed to be running on these machines to begin with um, for a different set of folders. Um, and so, yeah, there it is right there. It's in white on these machines. Um, so if I have one that's on red, this is the one that I know is the portable version if I go to look at it. So this takes a little bit of time, uh, as I said to download because it's downloading the actual Dropbox files. It's like 50 megabytes or whatever. So we have to be patient while that happens. OK, so it finally finished downloading. I apologize, sometimes when we're, when we're lecturing on stuff like this, there are little breaks um, where we have to just let stuff happen. Um, and so I let that happen. When it's done, I can't click on the button anymore. So it's already downloaded the files for me. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on the Next button. And then there'll be a button right here in the center for Start Dropbox Setup, which I'm going to go ahead and click on. It will present an option saying I have to restart Internet or I have to restart the Windows Explorer and blah 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 blah. Just say okay. And then I'll get the actual Dropbox setup. Okay, this is where you're going to start by logging into your Dropbox account. And so as I talked about with passwords, etc. There are moments where my life is really annoying using a password manager with a random string of numbers. This is one of them. So I have to go into my um, laptop here and I have to look up my Dropbox account so that I can actually get the correct password to type in. And so you guys have to bear with me while I do this um, because I have to look at it. So. And then I'll go ahead and sign in. And assuming I typed everything correctly, the there we go. And I'll, once I'm done, I'll go ahead and click this Close button. Um, and so this comes up, for, for some strange reason, um, about a folder named Dropbox. I'm going to go ahead and choose another location. And I'm going to go to my flash drive, which is listed under Computers, there and pick the drive itself here, and I'll say OK. And it will then, 
Um, yes. Okay, so it will then have finished. I'll go ahead and click on finished when I'm done here. And it will ask, do I want to restart my computer? I'm going to say no to restarting my computer because I don't really want to wait for you know, 20 minutes while these computers <laughs> restart. So I'll say no for right now. And now, if we give it a little bit of time, you can see that I still have the little spinning Windows thing. We can see down here that little red Dropbox icon. So you see I have the white Dropbox icon that's already going. I now have a little red Dropbox icon that's starting. Okay? The red one is representative of my flash drive, not the computer. And it's already downloaded the file that was in my Dropbox folder already, um, so it's already syncing the way it should. Okay? Now the one other thing that can happen relating to this particular service, um, and we'll eject the drive and plug it back in and, and you can see this in a second, is it does not start automatically. Right? So when I put the drive in in the first place, I have to double click the Dropbox portable application and it will then start. Okay? Because of some Windows security issues, they won't let me write a script to automatically start. It's essentially don't let me run a program that would install a virus on your computer. This obviously isn't a virus, but they block it as a whole um, so that we don't get to do it. Um, so anyway, you do actually have to start the application. The other thing that can happen is you might have to quit the application before you can eject your flash drive. Um, so if you need to do that, you'll have to come down to that little red icon or whatever color you chose. Um, and then you can go to the little gear and say exit Dropbox and then eject your flash drive. Okay? The nice thing about this is it'll keep your stuff backed up as you save it and you don't have to worry about it. You have to sacrifice a little bit of the annoyingness of starting it and stopping it, right? And getting in the habit of when you first plug in your flash drive, you have to actually start it for it to be running. Okay? So I've gone ahead and I have uh, the, the, the first part done for part one, which is the Dropbox Portable. For part two about the calendar, I'm going to point out a couple things relating to the calendar but I'm going to let you do that on your own because I think it's fairly self-explanatory. The key is that there is a feed for the calendar. So if I go to About and I go to the calendar feeds for 135, there is a calendar feed right here. That's the address that you're going to need uh, to be able to use to subscribe to the calendar feed. Um, it's, it's a challenging one for me because I'm already subscribed to it. I created the calendar in the first place, so it's hard for me to demonstrate. But if you have trouble, I can walk you through that on an individual basis. So that's part two. Uh, part three is optional, consolidating your email accounts. Uh, if you haven't already forwarded your school email and you don't check your school email, maybe it would be a good opportunity to forward your school email to your home email so you don't miss anything. Okay. So we're going to move on to part four, which is the LinkedIn part. And I'm going to ask you to spend about 30 minutes working on that. When you're done with that, you'll move on to part five, um, which has to do with creating the, the personal landing page. So we'll start with the LinkedIn page. I already have a LinkedIn profile, so I've just logged into it. Many of you will already have LinkedIn profiles, in which case you'll just log in and update yours. Um, the more time you spend on it, the more you can actually kind of work through it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click on myself here so that I can see my actual profile. Um, it gives you this little profile strength indicator as to how well you filled out the information that you have. Um, yours will probably start out at the bottom. The more information you add, uh, the more you'll get. So we have information about me. Uh, obviously, I could edit any one of these things uh, as we go through. We'll put in information about my education, right? and then we'll continue. I have experience. These are my 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 various jobs that I've done over time. All right, I have honors and awards, I have publications, etc. So for example, the publications, this is now version 4.0, I probably need to go back and edit that. Right, so there's a few things that I need to do uh, as I move forward. Um, and then obviously under skills, right, I have various skills that have been put in and uh, people endorse me for certain skills um, as we go forward. There's my education. Etc. So spend a little bit of time. It should be fairly self-explanatory in terms of how you're filling it out. But I want you to spend about 30 minutes uh, working on that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording for that 30 minutes. Um, and then we'll come back at about 10.10 and I'll walk you through the personal landing page. If you already feel like you've got LinkedIn down and you want to move on and do the personal landing page yourself, no problem. Go for it. 
uh, but I will actually demonstrate it. So if you feel like waiting and you want to wait for me to go through it, we'll do it at that point. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start back up and continue with uh, where I left off uh, into the flavors page and whatever. But I want to point out something on LinkedIn, uh, and that is that you can customize your address. So for example, for me, uh, it would be uh, linkedin.com slash in slash Grant A. Adams, I think. Yeah, that's me. So the point is that this is a whole lot better than a random string of numbers, and you can do that if you look at your, your profile right below your picture, you'll see an address right here. And there's a little, if you, if you mouse over it, there's like a little star that will show up. If you click on that, it'll allow you to edit your actual profile. It says your public profile URL, URL up here on the right side. I've already edited mine, which is why it's linkedin.com slash in slash Grant A. Adams. Okay? You can do the same thing with your own name. Okay? which is a lot of times much nicer than the random numbers or whatever that it gives you by default. Okay? So we'll come back to this. I'm going to leave it open in a tab. And so I'm going to go ahead and go to the flavors.me page. A lot of you, I was, I was floating around and I saw a lot of you already on this. It looks like you've, you've taken to this rather quickly, so I'm not overly worried about it. But a couple of the things that are very important that we're going to try to do is we're going to try to cross-link the posts that you make on the Digital Tools site, our site, with your personal landing page here on flavors.me. And what's going to happen is stuff like this, where I have all of my user posts. Let me move this for a second. Right? So when I click on a link here under my, my name, everything that I've posted in my user account will show up here as posts. So it's a way of cross-linking the content that I post on one site to the content that's on another site. So to do that, I'm going to go to the content section. I'm going to go to Add. And I'm going to pick, as I come down here, RSS. Okay? And when I pick RSS, I get an option here to be able to fill in a, uh, a feed URL. So I need a, a particular feed URL from the Digital Tools site. Uh, and to get that, I'm going to go to Tutorials, Digital Life, and then the flavors.me. Which is coming. There we go. And we can see right here that I have a URL right there digitaltoolsforarchitects.com slash author slash author name slash feed slash. Okay? The part that's bold here, author name, I'm going to replace with my username. So when I go to log in to the digital tools site, for example, I would type grant.adams and then I type in my password. The grant.adams is what's going to replace author name. So I'll go ahead and I'll copy this and I'll jump back over to my flavors.me page and I'll paste that in place. But I need to change where it says author name to grant.adams. Okay? And then I'll go ahead and click connect. And of course, when I do it, it says uh, it wasn't able to do it. Uh, let me try that again. I'll use. Let's see if it'll do it. It may not do it because I've already added it. Yeah, I think it didn't do it because I had already added it. Um, anyway, and there it is. Okay, So I can go through my list. I can go to Manage, and I can choose to delete or add certain uh, pieces. And I apologize that it, it gave me an error. It was because I already had it um, added. I'm going to go ahead and delete this one and say OK. Once I'm done, setting up my site. I've obviously I've uploaded a background image and whatever. I actually have to publish the site for the first time, which is where it will allow you to give your site a name. So some of you have already done this. Some of you haven't done it yet. Um, my site is grantadams.flavors.me. Okay? I'm going to take that address, and I'll go ahead and copy it. And I'm going to go back to my digital tools site, this site. I'm going to go to my dashboard. So I, uh, on this black bar at the top of the page, I click on where it says Digital Tools for Designers and Architects. 
I'm going to click on dashboard, which takes me to kind of my profile, my content here. And I'll click on the profile link. This is where you changed your password last class. And we're going to look at a few things. As I come down here on the list, okay, you see that I have my username, which is grant.adams here. Okay? I've gone ahead and I filled in my first name and my last name. Right? I could put a nickname in if I wanted. And I can choose how I want my name to be displayed when I'm on the website. Okay, but as I come down here, right, under website, I want to put that grantadams.flavors.me site. So I'm going to paste that information here under website. That's my home website because it's my personal landing page. Okay, I'm going to come down to the LinkedIn section and I'm going to paste in the address to my LinkedIn profile. So linkedin.com slash in slash grant a adams. Okay, now if you have other sites, you can go ahead and fill those in as well. Okay. Once you're done, you could also put a little biography about yourself, a little paragraph that explains who you are. Right? The profile picture comes from a website called Gravatar, which is an optional step written out. In here, you can register your email address with a profile picture, which means that on the website, it'll show up as your little picture instead of the, the um, you know, blank face or whatever. Uh, and then I'll continue down here, and I'll ultimately click on Update Profile. So what does this do for us when we do this? What it does is every time I make a post, so here's an example where I've made a post, right? it puts in this about the author category who I am, and it gives me a link to my home page, which if I were to click on, right, would take me to the flavors.me home page, which obviously didn't, I don't have the correct update, probably because this is the wrong account. Hold on a second, and let me... Let me get one that will actually work. OK, so this is my post from last class. I apologize. So here it is, about the author. This will lead directly to my flavors page, right? if I were to click on it. There it is. And this one would lead directly to my LinkedIn profile. So what this does is, is it associates the content that I produce, the things that I, that I make in this class and post, with my two online identities, my LinkedIn and my personal landing page. Okay? If we get to some of the ones that I post later on here, let's go to one of my lectures, which is from a different account. It's from my administrator account. right? You see that I have a lot more badges next to my name. Okay? The home one will take me to my personal landing page. The Facebook will take me to my Facebook page. Right? The Twitter will take me to my Twitter. The LinkedIn will take me to my LinkedIn. The Flickr will take me to my Flickr. The YouTube will take me to YouTube, etc. cetera. Okay? So all of those addresses, all of those online identities are now being cross-referenced and branded with any content that I put on the Digital Tools site. So the good news for you is that Google actively crawls the digital tool site. It's big enough, it gets, it's a, gets traffic, um, and it will index the site. And it will associate anything that you do, any post that you do, with those web addresses that represent you. So the longer that that happens, the better off you're going to be. The same thing happens ultimately when we get to comments. right? It will associate your comments, any comment you make, with your online identity and your online brand. So how do we make our final post for today? For today, you're going to go to your flavors.me page. Right? I'm going to minimize um, my design here. And I'm also going to minimize the web page a little bit so that it's not quite so big. Oops. Because it's rather large for right now. And I'll make it a little bit bigger so we see a little bit more. OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a screenshot of this particular page and be able to post that as my featured image. There is a key on your keyboard, and this is one of those impossible things. It's in the very upper row of keys, third from the end on the upper right that says print screen. I'm going to have to hold down the, uh, it's been a while since I did this. It's the function key, I think. Uh, let me try here. Ah, all I have to do, I don't have to hold down anything. I just have to hit the print screen. Okay, and what the print screen will let me do 
is it will let me take a screenshot of what's currently on my screen. And so if I make this a little bit bigger, you'll be able to see it. So it's taking a screenshot of what's on my screen, right, with my image. It might be easier if I make this the full size of the screen so that we just have the image to take care of. I'll hit print screen again. There it is. There's my image. I'm going to go up here to save. And I'm going to save this on my flash drive inside of my Dropbox folder. So let me go to my flash drive. Here's my Dropbox folder. I'm going to create a new folder for uh, 135 exercises. Inside of that folder, I'm trying to be organized. I'm going to create a new folder. This one will be 135 uh, exercise 102. And we'll open that. And I'll call this screenshot. Actually, technically, if I was following what I was talking about, this would be A135A screenshot EX102. And this is B01A, if I was following my own logic. Okay? Now, of course, you don't have to do that. You can name it whatever you want. And so I'll make sure that the save as type is JPEG. And then I'll go ahead and click on Save. Thanks. I might have to add JPG, and let's see if it'll do it that way. All right. Well, that's interesting. Let's see if I can upload it. So let me go and create a new post. So I'm going to go to New Post. And the good news is today there is no requirement for any text to be written. I just have to set a featured image. This is. Uh, exercise 102. And as I'm going down here, I'm going to go ahead and check the box for exercise 102. And then we'll keep going all the way to the bottom where it says set featured image. And let's see if it'll let me upload that file that I saved. If not, I'm going to have to go back and save it as a different type. There it is. Uh, file is empty. OK, something went wrong. So let me go back here. Let me try saving it instead of as a JPEG. Uh, let me try, I guess we'll try a GIF image and see if it'll save it that way. Oh, apparently, it likes that. So I saved it as a GIF image. Let me go back to the digital tool site. I'm going to upload again. This time, I'm going to pick this one. There it is. We'll go ahead and set the featured image. Shows up right there nicely. And so I'll scroll all the way back up to the top, and I'll press the Publish button. So I didn't have to actually type anything in the, the text field. I don't need any description of anything. I just needed a title and a featured image. And I'll go ahead and click on Publish. And that then will be turning in for part six, right? which is essentially the, the end uh, of what's required for today. OK, so if you have any questions, I'll come around and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, once this is published, I'll view the post to make sure that it's been posted. Um, but I'm fairly confident that it will work. There we go. And I'll come around and answer any questions. Give me one second.